Hello, and welcome back to my channel. Today I will be doing another Dantean post, which I know I've not done for a very long time. This is based off of a post which I wrote for my um, main blog in April of 2021, when my um, theme for blogging from A to Z April was um, Dante, his world, and the divine comedy, and everything related to him. It's about his um, political treatise, De Monarchia, which I did for letter M, so let's just get down with it. De Monarchia is a three-part treatise Dante wrote anywhere between the 1290s and the final year of his life, 1321. Since this wasn't an era when people tended to date their work, and record-keeping wasn't as precise as it is today, we can only guess. Some people believe he wrote it while he still lived in his beloved Florence, while others think it was a heralding or commemoration of Holy Roman Emperor Henry VII coming to Italy, and thus was written from about um, 1308 to 1314, somewhere in there. Still other scholars believe it was one of Dante's final works, written from 1318 to 1321. Though Dante argued for the use of vernacular language in De Vulgari Eloquentia, he chose to write De Monarchia, De Vulgari Eloquentia, Eclogues, and Questio de Aqua et Terra in Latin because it was a, sure, a much wider audience. If he wrote in Italian, he'd only reach people in his own homeland, border regions, and nearby areas under Italian rule. In the Middle Ages, Latin was Europe's lingua franca, understood by all educated people, and while obviously many people know a French eventually eclipsed Latin in a major way in that regard, Latin did still continue to be a language, you know, used by scholars in many, many different fields until the um, 19th century. I'm not sh quite sure it like, continued into the like 20th century for most people, but definitely there were still many scholarly books, like, for example, music, history, science, etc., still being written in Latin throughout the 19th century because that was just, you know, the, like the language intellectuals stood and it was like easier to like read and communicate with other people. Like French was not used as like the language of, you know, like academic and intellectual stuff. It was more, you know, like diplomacy and stuff and just, you know, like of something people would speak as a second language to appear educated and such. So anyway, because this book isn't easy to find in translation and the subject isn't exactly lighthearted or of general interest, not many modern people have read it. As much of a passionate Dante file as I am, even I can't see many people choosing to read it for fun. It's the kind of thing people might point to on their bookshelves as proof of how intellectual and educated they are, but aren't very likely to have actually read it unless they're hardcore medieval history scholars. And I mean, it wasn't easy for me to read, not because, you know, it's a super long book or difficult to understand, but it's just, you know, not a like a light-hearted topic most people are, you know, down for reading for fun. De Monarchia comes to about 28,000 words plus a lot of modern explanatory footnotes. So it's not a very long read, and I know the word count because I was thinking of possibly uh, printing it out and reading it at my leisure instead of off of my computer screen in preparation for like researching and writing this A to Z post, but I ended up not printing it because it would take up you know way too many pages and it was just you know easier to read it off of the computer screen. But again, it's not very long at all, so it m probably shouldn't take you more than a day or so, like or a few hours if you're interested in reading it. Don't come to it expecting to be blown away by beautiful, timeless poetry. This is about the relationship between religious, i.e. papal, and secular, i.e. the Holy Roman Emperor. Dante tries to be fair to both sides instead of taking one absolute position and tearing apart any other views. Dante's position is that both the Pope and Emperor are human and derive their authority and power directly from God. Because they are both humans and peers, they shouldn't have power over one another. While Dante was always very careful to kiss up to the Pope and take his religious authority seriously, he also didn't think one peer should rule over another. Only God has the right to do that. Instead, the Pope and Emperor are two equal swords, each given power by God, to rule over their own respective domain. They should respect one another's different spheres and not encroach upon matters and territories which aren't theirs. The purpose for which God created humans, Dante believes, is to make full use of our highest intellectual potential. And to do that, we need universal peace, a sentiment which I obviously agree with very, very much. If we're forced to deal with wars, internal strife, and political bickering, we can't accomplish our work very easily or freely. It's a natural order of things for one person to assume the leading role in a household, community, city, empire, etc. Very rarely can two equals share power without clashing, since the desire to be top dog and have no competitors is so strong, even when the people genuinely love and respect one another and aren't trying to, like, oversee, like, or step on someone's, you know, authority or, like, take over what they're doing. It's just, you know, natural for personalities to 
clash when they you know, both want, want the same thing. Thus, the world needs one unified leader for its well-being. Humanity is made in the image of God and is ordered for the best when, according to the utmost of its power, it becomes like unto God. And when we unite as one, we most live up to our divine image, since God is also one. However, we need a single monarch and empire to achieve this oneness. And this is also very much felt in Judaism. If you might know our central prayer, the Shema says, you know, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So we obviously believe God is one. Also, and I really can't under, I mean, I can kind of sort of like understand where they're like coming from doing counter missionary work, but it's just like, I can't understand where certain Orthodox rabbis are coming from when they're like holding by an opinion from, you know, like 2000, close to that years ago and like saying like, you know, Islam and Christianity are like idol worship because they don't actually worship one God. They have the Trinity or they like hold Muhammad to a very high like platform with God. That's, you know, not what like mainstream rabbis, even Orthodox rabbis believe. Obviously we understand, you know, like Christianity and Islam are both um, monotheistic, just like Judaism anyway. If you're interested, that's, I totally do not share that opinion it kind of like it's hard to do interfaith dialogue when people are like you know, holding by like really old outdated opinions saying oh you're idolatry because you don't live up to my like beliefs about religion so anyway i'm sorry if i'm getting off topic justice is most effective when the monarch is just and the worst enemy of justice is greed dante idealistically believes this perfect world monarch has no reason for greed since she has nothing to desire with all his power and wealth Greed is only manifested among rulers of individual cities and kingdoms. Love and charity exist to the highest degree in this monarch, and thus his sense of justice is magnified and most effective. Because of this great love, humans are most free when ruled by a monarch instead of game-playing politicians. Like, you know, what else is new? This is like a sentiment that can echo across many centuries. Dante supports local rulers and laws since every region has different needs but the monarch should still govern in general matters germane to all humans. As an Italian, Dante was obviously biased in claiming his Roman ancestors as the noblest people on earth, and therefore deserved precedence over all others. He cites myths and fictional stories with heroes who can do no wrong, exaggerated and apocryphal historical stories, and biblical liter literalism. And I'm, obviously, I'm not going to you know, like bash him or judge him by like modern-day standards for this, but you know, it was kind of like difficult to read that like, you know, people in the Middle Ages didn't really understand a lot of like stories were like purely mythological or they would take like mythological or semi-legendary historical figures and like magnify them into these, you know, great legends who absolutely existed no matter what and just, you know, like make up all these claims about their lives. And, you know, it was, you know, kind of like, you know, a snowballing effect. Soon people believe they absolutely lived and lost track of the fact that they were mythological and um, in his um, day they believed the Aeneid was a real story and Aeneas was a real person. One of the um, reasons like I had a hard time reading the Aeneid when I was um, a senior in high school and by the way I'm hoping maybe maybe this month or maybe next month to finally do a full um, adult reread of the book. You know I it was it was more difficult for me than um, the Iliad and the Odyssey because like Homer's heroes are like more like fully human and they like mess up and do like wrong things. They're not you know like these like super duper perfect characters who can do no wrong just like the epitome of all you know virtue and all this good stuff but anyway and also in his day we didn't really have like a um, modern day well I'm, as far as I know maybe there were a few like you know radicals but this was not like a mainstream opinion then people you know doing like scholarly research to say you know oh, the bible was written by humans over like you know many hundreds of years obviously we believe they were like divinely inspired and stuff and like not most of the stuff in the bible does you know like have a current of historical truth even if it might you know some of it might be like race memories for example but anyway i'm sorry if i'm getting off topic but again in the middle ages it was like common for people to believe what all 100 percent of the bible was literally true just like they would believe the aeneid and like the iliad and the odyssey if they could read greek and just you know other mythological stories were true but anyway that's the kind of worldview Dante was coming from so we can't like really judge him harshly or make fun of him by modern standards because like how would he have known any different that was just you know what he was taught and what everyone around him believed he had no like counter example against this but anyway I'm sorry if I'm getting off topic again. Dante interprets the Romans many military victories over other empires in huge expanse of territory as proof God was on their side. Lots of theological opining under the guise of historicity and political science follows. And again, this is also kind of like where you're like straddling the fence between, oh, I want to like judge a person fairly because like in their like historical era, they wouldn't have, you know, 
thought or known any differently, but at the same time viewing it as a modern person, like seriously, dude, I mean, obviously it can be like definitely a military victory and you can interpret that as a miracle when you have a very small army that's outnumbered by like hostile enemies who are making war on you. Like for example, the like miraculous victories in the, the Six Day War and the Yom Kippur War, but like the Romans, they were this like huge military empire going around conquering everyone. And of course, obviously he's biased as an Italian saying, oh, of course God had to be on their side because they were winning all the time against these other people. And if these other people were favored by God, you know, why were they defeated? So again, that's just something you want to keep in mind. He had a much, much different view of things as like someone living in the Middle Ages. So, you know, kind of like it's a historical artifact, obviously, like his main points are still very true, but some of the reasoning he uses to come to these conclusions are obviously very, very much um, colored by, you know, being like a medieval Christian European who just like didn't know any differently. While Dante believes the Pope has authority to rule the church, he also thinks the Pope should stay in his lane and not meddle in secular governance. In other words, he advocates separation of church and state. Radical thinking for the 14th century. In 1329, the Monarchia was burnt at the stake as heretical due to charges brought by French Cardinal Bertrand du Poget. This was the same person who sought to have Dante's bones burnt at the stake, and thank God he never got his way with that one. In 1559, the Inquisition included De Monarchia in its first index of forbidden books. It remained on the list till the end of the 19th century. And it's like very easy to come by. It's on public domain. I found it online somewhere. I don't remember if it was from the Princeton Dante Project or from somewhere else, but I just like, you know, copied and pasted it into a document. I don't remember if I like kept in all the footnotes or anything. I just mostly read it all the way through and skimmed through some of the footnotes. Although if you're like seriously reading it and when I go back to reread it someday I would like to you know, reread it with all the footnotes but these were kind of like really old footnotes it was an old translation I believe from the very early 20th century so a lot of you know more like intense and different Dante scholarship has been done since then and in addition just you know a general like different understanding of history and interpretation of such so I would very much like a more modern edition of this book to read so thank you very much for listening to the end. I'm sorry if I've not been doing like videos as often as I have in the past, but it's very hard to keep motivation when I have such a tiny viewership. Hopefully if I ever get to 100 subscribers, I will, you know, have new motivation to do things and do all sorts of interesting kinds of videos I've been holding back on because I just don't have enough people like guaranteed to watch them. And I will be um, doing hopefully in the near future this um, book, which I'm reading very almost finished with. It's a very difficult, difficult emotionally to read, as I mentioned previously, that the uh, Researching um, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is the most emotionally difficult thing I've, you know, ever done over my life as a writer. I just, I'm mean, interested in Jap Japanese history. It's just so, so, like, difficult for me as I'll get into more in that post. And I'll so my next post will be on July 17th and 18th. It, that will be the 104th anniversary of the murder of the last imperial family of Russia, both um, Nicholas II and his um, wife, children, and four servants on July 17th and on July 18th. And number of his um, extended family members, mostly cousins, and um, the Empress Alexandra's sister Ella, who had become a nun, and a few other people attached to them, like servants, and another nun were murdered then in um, Alapayevsk in Siberia, and I will be possibly discussing this book, An Alternative History about Tsar Alexei, the second which I released on July um, 17th, um, 2018, which was the 100th anniversary of their assassination, so um, look ahead to that, and thank you very much for listening, um, please um, consider um, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing. If you haven't already, I really do appreciate seeing comments from people and helping to build my channel and become friends with people. Um, so I'll um, see you again very soon. Thanks. Bye.